Thank you, Miller. Um, so can you hear me from the other end? So I'm going to shout uh, through my presentation. So I'm um, very happy to be here to share um, something that I learned about complexity. So my background is on nonlinear dynamics and chaos. So while working on this area, um, and especially I'm associated with Complexity Institute. Sorry, I clicked the wrong button. And starting to work on issue on complexity, um, one question that comes to my mind is, what is complexity? Well, we know that in quantum you have entanglement. So we say, what is entanglement? And you can define it. But in the case of complexity, many people work on it. And of course, the question is, can one quantify complexity as well? So that question leads me into the field. And I'm also amazed by nature. You can see that nature is so diverse. You have patterns in the astronomical scale, macroscopic scale, of course, even in the mesoscopic scale. So all these patterns are very different from something that we know from physics, where things are like disorganized in the sense of ideal gas, or very regular, like the case of pendulum. So is there a way to explain these structures to quantify it? So here, the idea of pattern and organization, I realized I learned from Professor James Crutchfield, who is here. Very happy that. Um, I, I know about his work many years ago, but never see him before. <laughs> so I'm really glad that he's here. Yeah. <laughs> so he said that nature inherently organizes. Pattern is the fabric of life. Very, very well quoted. So it gave me a lot of thoughts about it. And of course, now, as physicists, we always try to think of some canonical example. And a clock and a coin flip is a very simple example in which you can think of it as classical mechanics and statistical mechanics at the two ends. So you see that physicists can able to somehow de derive theory for these two regimes, but what about something in between? Something that is, you would say, there is also regularity and complexity, uh, regularity and randomness that is somehow intermixed together. That gives us some intuitive feeling about complexity. So therefore, complexity is said to be lie somewhere in between these two extremes. Now, if you were to look at the literature, there are many different definitions of complexity. Um, well, of course, the one that is most familiar would be the entropy, the Shannon entropy, or in fact, also the thermodynamic entropy. Um, in the case of computation, there's also Kolmogorov shading complexity, and also fractal dimension if you are in the area of nonlinear dynamics. And many of these definitions relates to how difficult it is to describe the system of interest. As, as for example, like in the case of um, Kolmogorov shading complexity, it's like the shortest program to describe a string. Whether it's a random string, you need to be exactly the same length as a random string to describe it. For the periodic sequence, it will be the block of the period plus how many times it repeats. So that defines the difficulty in description. Well, you can also talk about in time. So that's where you have computational complexity, whether something can be solved efficiently in polynomial time or exponential time, or logical theft, where you have a shortest program, but how long does it need, need to run it to reach the pattern that you need to see? And well, the topic of interest today will be on degree of organization. When you see a pattern or structure, is there a way you can describe it quantitatively through a very, very useful idea or model? And I'm going to talk a lot about this topic called Epsilon machine. I'm going to talk about the topological version as well as, well, one that is um, not topological, where you can measure relating in the conditional dependence uh, based on conditional probability. Okay, so we start with Epsilon machine. Why Epsilon machine is something that is very nice, um, something that we should think deeper about. Now, first, it is an optimal predictor of the system process. It gives rise to a minimal representation, the idea that it is the smallest. And it is unique. Now, I have mentioned about a few types of complexity before. Kolmogorov shading complexity and logical depth and so, so forth. Now, many of those complexity 
measure has one problem. It is uh, computability. Are you able to compute it? That's a problem. Now, in the case of Epsilon machine, the most attractive feature is that you can compute it, you can construct it. So in the next many slides I'm going to show you, in fact, I'm going to show you how you can construct the Epsilon machine um, through examples. And once you're able to construct it, then it would allow you to say something about the complexity of, for example, the sequence. So how complex is this sequence compared to another sequence? Then you are able to quantify it and say something meaningful. So that is the, the goal. And one of the nice things is that it is represent, representational independence. So it's independent of the representation that you talk about it. So I'm going to give you the main idea. This idea already spoken in the few talks beforehand. But to put things into perspective, I just repeat it. Um, now, we have symbolic sequences. You will see that there is the past and the future. So the, the, the arrow on top indicate to you that this is the future. Backwards means the past. Now, the idea here of Israel machine is that different paths may give you the same future in the statistical sense, in this sense of conditional probability. So those paths are the same, it's grouped together to form a causal state. So all this S4 here, the causal state would have the similar paths that give you the same future. So you need to partition it into this, in this way. And now the idea is that if we have a time sequence or time series, we are need to find this partition. And once we find the partition and also the transition between these causal states, you've got the Epsilon machine. So that's the whole idea. And how does the Epsilon machine relate to physical process? That's also important because many things that we see actually is not put in the symbolic form, not in one and zeros, not in um, numbers. So you need to somehow measure it. So when you measure it, of course you measure in time, right? You need to measure in some discrete time moments. After you measure the signal, there's amplitude. So you may want to quantize it into different level. So that gives you the alphabet of the signal. So here itself, uh, tau itself gives you the discrete time. The epsilon itself is some sort of quantization in terms of phase space. And that's the, where epsilon comes about in this context. And so each cell can be assigned a label leading to some list of alphabets, like 0, 1, 2, and so on and so forth. So if let's say we talk binary, it will be just 0 and 1. And in my talk later, you just see that I will just focus on binary time series. So start. So I'm going to show you how we can construct epsilon machines through this example. By looking at it, you can see that it is simply a period three sequence. Okay. So the idea here is that we start with a state here, which is like a transient state or the, the, the starting state or initializing state. And then we form this symbolic sequence based on the pattern here, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. So you see 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and so on and so forth. And then now we shift our window one bit off. So just shift it. So now the pattern is 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and so on and so forth. But you don't see it here yet, so I start from here. 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. So you see that this is how it is constructed based on one shift. Then you continue to shift it. And then you form the next one, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So you, you form it this way. So now these are the possibility because if you shift it one more time, you will come back to this this sequence. So I don't need to do it again. So that's where I stop. Then next thing is to assign the state, the causal state. So this is the, we look at um, this level one. So we assign one here because this is the first time we assign. We want to see whether this one corresponds to the one. Is that, does, we, does we have the same topological pattern that is here? So look at this. It doesn't have. Either this and this doesn't have the same pattern as one, so we put it as two, and here itself it doesn't have the same pattern as one as well, we put it as three. Okay? 
So we have such a transition from state 1 to 2 and 3. Now we go to the next level. Now if you look at this, this is 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. This is 1, 0. So you see that this is the same pattern topologically. So therefore, we can set that as 3. Okay, that's the idea of what you mean by 3. And these two, you see that you cannot find similar pattern anywhere. So we got to assign them as 4 and 5. Okay? So then you have here a new transition, 2 to 4 and 3. Go to level 3. Do the same. Now you see here is the same. 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. And if you look at no, 1, 0, 0, 1. So it is 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. It's, it's 1, 0, 0, 1. So you see that this pattern is the same as this. So you know that this is going to be 3. And you can do the same for the rest, which is here, 5. Onwards, this is 0, 0, 1. This is 0, 0, 1. Zero. So you see that this pattern is the same as this. So you know that this is 5. And then this is 4. Okay? So now you extract those things from here. You see that this 4 to 3 give you 1. This give 3 to 5 give you 0. So you just extract those information out from the assignment here. So it's 5 to 4 give you 0. So now you see that all this can be continued to work on it, and you assign all the states in this way. So you have all the transition working through this diagram. And you put this together, and you form the epsilon machine. So this is the way it is constructed. Now you can see that there are um, this transition from 1 to 2 and 1 to 3. Now this is topological. So that comes about um, in the equiprobable sense. So this is about 1 third and this is 2 third and this is from half and half. Now but important point is to see that I draw them as blue and brown because those are blue one are transient. You will see from one, you go to three, then three probability one, you go to five, probability one, go to four, and probably one go to three. So you, you just cycle around the three, five and four. You will never go back to the blue one. So therefore the blue state are called the transient state. And the brown one is still the recurrent state. And those are the steady state that is of interest. And the zero there will be the output of the state. That is how we construct the epsilon machine in, in a way. And um, now, there are two um, processes that's very important in idea of complexity. One of them is the <coughs> process where you have a, a string of ones. Okay? The string of one is a regular process. It's the, a very simple process. So in complexity measure, it is think of as complexity measure of zero. The other one is the fair coin process. In terms of statistical sense, it is also very simple. So we expect them to have complexity measure of zero, which is the same case in the case of Epsilon machine. After I define for you, I have not defined statistical com complexity yet, the, the mathematical definition, but when I define it, you will see that it is indeed given to be zero. So these are extreme cases of complexity. They are structurally simple, and we expect their complexity measure to be zero. <coughs> and while I have given you to show you the case when it is periodic, um, one interesting um, system for us to learn about complexity would be the logistic map. Logistic map is a map uh, that creates chaotic sequences, but it also has regular sequences. So you have a mixture of regularity and randomness. So it is something interesting to look up about. So I'm going to use the examples here of a logistic map um, to again explain the idea of um, the construction. This is given by uh, Krasio and Yang in the paper. So important in the construction is to define what you call the tree length. Um, in this case, it will be the full length. I think the battery is out. So I there's a full length from the top to the bottom, and also we need to uh, define what you call the machine length to construct the machine. So here, the logistic map is defined as a hum, uh, single hum uh, system. And the interesting part, 
as you can see, is that it has period doubling. As you change the control parameter R, um, the system can be regular and become period 2, period 4, period 8. Uh, the period doubles until you converge to a chaotic um, regime. So, and at R equal to 3.569946, in fact, it is chaotic. And we can make a partition of the logistic map between 0 and 1. And if it goes to, as you go chaotically between uh, the two regime, xi less than 0 0.5, xi greater equal to 0 0.5. If you go below, we give it 0. If go above, we give it 1. So as you go in a very irregular sense, you will see bit streams that are pretty irregular. So now, in the construction, um, again, the way you, we form these uh, bubbles here is the same as I just described previously. So I'm not going to repeat that construction, but I give you the idea. So the idea here is that, again, you go to the level. Now, in this case, it's a bit more complicated. You need to look at the pattern. So here, you look at that pattern. Uh, the first dotted group and the second dotted group, actually, they have the same structure, tree structure. So we call it subtree similarity. So that structure allows us to define the causal state to be one as well, okay? Because they have the same topological structure. The next one do not have, so we define it as two. So to go to the next level, again, you see that that has the same structure, so it allows you to go to one and the other one have the same structure as two, it's assigned as two. So we go level by level. And that goes to three. And then go to the next level. And you see that the same pattern over there, that gives you two. So from those, you can start to observe the transition between the causal state. that allows you to construct it, okay? So that's the idea. So here again, the blue one is the transient state. And how does it work is that now you imagine that we run our process through using the epsilon machine. So this output a one, this output a zero. So after it comes through here, you will never go back to one anymore. So one is a transient state, you come out one, and go to one there, go back there, go to zero. Okay, so that's how it works. Now, what I just showed you is the topological machine. Um, but we know that it depends on the conditional dependence, right? The probabilistic, uh, the part where the past, similar past will give you the same future. Uh, you group them together to be the same causal state. So. Essentially, uh, in the case where you have some sort of uh, um, transition that is stochastic, so that topological approach would have some difficulty in determining it. So here itself is an approach by Charlizzi, uh, Charlizzi and Crutchfield. So this is what I call the causal state splitting reconstruction. Um, I'm illustrating here is the even process in the paper underneath. So you see that here by um, again, you have the sequence of 1 and zeros. You can count the number of 1 and 0. So in this case, if only 1, you see that there's uh, the total number of sequences is about um, 9996. And then out of the 9996, 6687 are 1 and 3309 are 0. So you can find the probability of 0 and 1 from there. So that gives you the first um, starting point or initialization in the approach. Next is that. Here itself, you see that you can continue with looking at the history. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So that is like 0, the, the, the parent is, um, so the, the one on the, this side here, the parent is 0. This side here, the parent is 1. So you can actually accumulate the count. For those that, in your time series, the probability that the parent is 
0, if you output 0, you see that 3309, the parent is 0, but out of that, 1654 output is 0. So that you can calculate the conditional dependence. So that gives you a probability of 0 0.5. Similarly, for the other one, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, and 0 0.75. Okay? So we can keep doing this continuously. So that for now, you see they're capturing the history, but also capturing the, the statistics okay? each time by counting, in, by grouping your time series into groups, and keep doing it until a certain level. So you need to define a level. In this case, the level, maximum level is 3. After that, then again, you go back, we go back to assign the causal state. Now, you see that I, did, I have put them into colors. The red one, for example, you see the red one has the same statistics, 0.25 and 0.75, like this one, 0.25 and 0.75. And the brown one, in fact, has a statistic of 0.5 and 0.5. Okay? Now, here itself, there's something subtle. Because, for example, you see the brown one there is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, but the other one is 0 0.51 and 0 0.49. So it's not necessary that you always have the same number. There's some, there's some um, differences. So therefore, there's a need to do some sort of chi-square test uh, to ensure that, well, those group or morph, they call it, right, um, belongs to the same causal state. Okay? So as to try to use the test to see whether it's significant enough to separate the causal state as much as possible. If not, then you need to introduce new causal state. So the idea is to make it as small as possible, as far as possible. If you can't, then you've got to increase the state. So that's how minimality is achieved. Okay? So therefore, in this case, this is the causal state A, causal state C and B. Now you see that those, the same color, the statistics are the same, is C, B, C, D. So from here, you can assign everything and you put, put it together. This is the Isolon machine. That where you consider statistics into take statistics into play. So again, the blue one is the transient state, and the brown one is the recurrent state or the, the state that eventually will be cycling through. Okay. So in a way, you can think of it as a stochastic epsilon machine. The previous one is a deterministic one. With the construction of the epsilon machine, which I just described, then now you can start to compute the statistical complexity. So P here is, in fact, the probability of the occurrence of the causal state, of each causal state. And from there, calculate C mu. Another interesting thing that can be computed from um, this sort of machine is the metric entropy. And for us, an uh, interesting diagram that we compute would be this one. This is from, in fact, the logistic map. Um, this is the complexity entropy diagram. You can see that uh, at the left end here, with this line here, this is zero. So this is the simplest uh, process. It's like the all, all ones, okay? Um, but as you increase, the age increase, actually these are period doubling. Remember the bifurcation, the period doubling uh, through to chaos? This is the period doubling. And this part here is the chaotic region. When we have the bifurcation, this is the part where you see that the complexity is, seems to be even lower than the one that is in the uh, period doubling region. And here itself is the edge of chaos. Theoretically, it should be maximum. But because we are using finite machine computation, so that is, uh, it should be infinite. It should be infinite. But uh, because of the finite computation that we have, it is not infinite, but some maximum value. Okay, next I'm going to talk about how we can use it to describe some symbolic sequence um, in which um, we can capture some of this complexity uh, in the sequence. So this is an fractal system that we have um, looked into, and we use it to construct a uh, symbolic sequence and study its complexity. Now the first um, one on the left, you, you can see that uh, we have two segments, n equal to 2 means two segments, um, with an opening angle of 2 pi over 3. So when we construct this arc fractal, uh, we need to define the opening angle. Um, and also, whether it is 
the R is going inwards or outwards. So on the right hand side, we have four segments. Um, in this case, the opening arc is pi. So you see that it is um, the base, the first one, the dotted one, is fully pi. Then when, you, when we scale it down, um, we need to divide the angle into equal to four and then iterate through. And then the, 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 the rule is that it is going to be in, out, in, out. Okay, so the omega here is in, out, in, out. So therefore, by doing this, we keep doing this, um, scaling it down further and further, we can construct final and final arcs. And if we use the same rule of doing it, that's a single rule, but we can also use multiple rule. Means that we can, for example, in, at this level, use the, the rule on the left, the next level, use the rule on the right, or we randomly swap the rules. So the interesting part about this rule is that just by this single rule, we can construct all the different fractals that is possible, like caught snow, caught snowflake, Hayway, dra Hayway um, Dragon, Levy, Sierpinski, Eisenstein. So just the rule just stated here. So this is how it looks for the fractals that generated. So this one is one popular one, the Sierpinski cascade. We can also use this approach just to you go, you go final and final, you will just approach it. But why this is interesting? Because it can produce sequence. The sequence is based on the orientation. For this orientation, we, we say that at that orientation, it is 11, that is 7, and that's 3. So therefore, we can map whatever we construct to a symbolic sequence. For this, just three symbols. So we just con convert it to a base 3. Process. So this is an example. You see that this is 4, this is 2, this is 8. So whatever the orientation, this direction is, is defined with a symbol. So we can, as we iterate more and more, the sequence will become longer and longer. Now, with that sequence, we can use to study it um, with different measure. Of course, one measure that we look at is the fractal dimension. D. So you see that Levy and Hayway have the fractal dimension of 2. Arrowhead and Crab is a fractional dimension. Um, number of symbols. <coughs> the first two have four symbols. Last two has three. Entropy. These two are the same. Similarly for the complexity. So this is a classical complexity measure. We find this to be interesting, especially, because when we construct it, it turns out that crab and arrowhead is exactly the same if not machine. They're exactly the same. So that's why you get the same um, answer. But when you look at the fractal, this and this, they look different. But they have the same classical, classical complexity. So that's something that we find a bit interesting. But we start to understand that this is something to do with the rule because this is complementary. In, out, in, and out, in, out. So that may be the reason. But structurally, they are the different. So you see, the idea is this. If some machine is supposed to provide us with a way to characterize the structure. So here itself, the orientation of the arc is a structure. So we're trying to use it to understand um, the structure in the arc fractal system. And we also see that the, the greater, the larger the number of symbols, the larger the complexity measure. And one interesting problem that we thought about using this um, is to test it on human. So the idea is this. Um, now, can a human being able to perceive complexity? So if we give him a sequence that is of low complexity and ask him to guess the next symbol, this may come from the symbolic sequence that, that we talked about. So instead of using one, two, three, we use pictures like this and ask, okay, can you guess what is the next one? So if we, if we provide a certain sequence with a certain complexity and guess, and then get some, uh, some answer in which uh, to know how accurate is the guess, and then we increase the complexity of the sequence and keep doing it. So it, can we somehow deduce our mind, our ability to detect 
complexity. So you can see the value of your ability to quantify complexity and use it to do further, to do further experiment on understanding another complex system, which is our, our brain. Okay. So I, I find that this is one possibility. Okay, so I finish with classical and come to quantum. But I realize that my talk is just going in between these two. So you'll see what I mean soon. Now, next is that Miller has come up with the framework of the quantum Ethereum machine. So this is just um, the approach by Miller. I just draw the whole um, Ypsilon machine in the most general sense. So this is the most general one. So there's all possible transition and you, from there, from the classical version, you can write it in terms of the quantum version. And I realize that this thing may be able to go to and fro. So if you go to from quant classical to quantum, maybe from quantum back to classical, maybe. So this is something to discuss and to think about. But let me go through the the notation and uh, terminology before I talk about some new ideas that come out of this. So first, the definition is that we have a causal state given by SJ, and then we have R, um, which is, okay, the K itself is related to the next state, um, next causal state that you will go to, and the R is the output symbol. That's the one where you got, got the stochastic output that is correspond to the classical one. Understanding this notation is important because I'm going to introduce a, some change to this. Okay. Um, now, based on that, we can define quantum complexity with rho being the density matrix defined in this way with respect to the quantum causal state. And of course, we all know that C mu is greater or equal to CQ and also greater or equal to E, the excess entropy. Okay. First, we try to do something with this. And we try to compare it against the, uh, the complexity versus uh, entropy graph for the logistic map. So, well, nothing surprising. Um, CQ is always lesser than C mu. Um, for the periodic case, they are the same. Also not surprising because later I can show you that in that case it's orthogonal. The quantum state is orthogonal, so that's why they have, have to be the same. Here itself, there can be non-orthogonality. Normality, that's why it's lower, as explained already in the morning. Okay, so it's satisfying that this works, and of course we construct it. You know, we like epsilon machine, so we 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 do it and we construct it. So you see that this is the actual value. This is at the age of chaos. Uh, this is at r equal to three point seven one five, and this is closer to the chaotic region. Okay. Now, so this is the part where I have some question. It may be my question or idea or whatever. So let's discuss. And so this is the last part of my of my slide. So I, I can go as far as I can as for, for me to prepare for this talk. Okay. Now remember that, or maybe for the experimentalist. So this could be something interesting. I will. I was wanting to ask this question, but I think it's easier for me to explain here than ask the question. Okay. So it related to experiment, also measurement. We know that. Uh, this 1 and 0 here, right, is where you measure the output, okay? Um, so based on this, we know that in the case, this is a periodic sequence. You see, this is a, uh, machine is just periodic. Go to S1 to S2, S2 to S1, and so on and so forth. So we can write the causal state to be like this. You can see that they are orthogonal. That's why CQ is equal to C mu. But we know that in quantum, you can always change the measurement basis, right? So the measurement basis for the, this one. Okay. So imagine that I change it. Right. Just like in quantum cryptography, the BB84, whatever, you can always change your basis. So I, I, I change it, and there is the general quant qubit measurement basis, where they can be expressed relative to each other. So in that, in that sense, I can then put this and this into here and see what happens. Then I, I got something like that. S1 and S2. I just did that. Of course, after I did that, then, uh, well, I'm just like going between quantum and classical. 
So I come back to reconstruct the classical epsilon machine. I don't know whether that makes sense, but this is for discussion. Okay? So I come back to construct it. So based on what we understand about quantum mechanics, so that is like the probability from S1 to S2. Now it's alpha. It's no longer 0 and 1. So it's alpha. Because now we use another measurement, right? Okay. So I, I got this new epsilon machine, classical version. So now we see that just now it was periodic. But this not. This is actually a stochastic epsilon machine. Something like the one that uh, in the paper, in the Nature Comms paper. I, I do the same now to the... This is a bit different from the Nature Comms paper, but uh, something similar. So this is the, the one where it's in the paper. Um, you have the, the, like the perturbed coin or something, but of course I think this Q1 and Q0 is a bit different. Right? Yeah. So for this, we have it this way. Okay. Now I do the same thing. I, I would like to change this to the, the other basis, alpha and beta. And that is what I did. I change it, and that becomes the one on top. And now if I were to do a measurement, and suppose that I, the measurement give me alpha, then the state will be collapsed into this. And you now have a superposition of the causal state. So I don't know what that means. But it seems to be some sort of, you have some sort of superposition of some epsilon machine. Something like that. So pretty interesting. So you can keep doing this. And I don't know. When the picture doing this, it gave me to the thing of Mandelbrot set. I, yeah. So I, I thought that you have this infinite regress. If you try to measure, you change your basis and keep measuring, you have some sort of infinite regress when you use quantum epsilon machine. So there could be some possibility. So this is one thing that came out of the work. The last idea that I have would be just recently someone just told me about my reading machine. Uh, Shannon, uh, very interested in mind reading. So he came up with some mind reading machine to, 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 to show that well he can read the mind and when you test it on human being actually can do it better than randomness. Okay. So well that also let me think about this. Could classical Isolo machine act as a mind reading machine in the sense of Claude Shannon? And would the quantum version do better? So I leave you two with these two ideas. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and three, three of them is in group working on this. Thank you.